Hi, I'm Ed Clark. I'm the president and co-founder of the Wildlife Center of Virginia. And this is what I look like today, 40 years after that picture was taken. Uh, we won't dwell on the differences. November 9th, 1982 was the day the Wildlife Center of Virginia was incorporated. Back then, we were known as the Shenandoah Valley Wildlife Treatment and Rehabilitation Center, a name that lived in nobody's memory. But in 1985, we became the Wildlife Center of Virginia, and that's what we remain today. Now, over the last 40 years, we've had an incredible amount of accomplishment, success, and achievement. We've treated nearly 100,000 wild animals of hundreds of different species. We've trained more than 1,000 wildlife veterinarians, trained them to use their general veterinary skills for the very specialized world of clinical wildlife medicine. And we have reached more than 2 million people with our online and in-person outreach and education programs. We've made a difference worldwide. Now, this difference could not have been made without you, our supporters, our donors, and our friends. So thank you for that. The video you're about to enjoy is, is a look back, and there'll be some times when you'll laugh out loud as you see some of us who are quite different today from what we were 40 years ago. But also you'll see that this organization started in a barn that we shared with horses. And today we're a state-of-the-art veterinary facility and we're about to make some big changes even in that. So thanks, enjoy the video, sit back and watch 40 years condensed to just a few minutes and I hope you enjoy. It all started November 9th, 1982. Two young couples were chatting over dinner about their interest in the outdoors, the environment, and especially wildlife and the problems that man creates for wild animals. Inquiries to veterinarians and environmentalists had determined that there was a need for a wild animal treatment hospital, so they decided to start one. Stuart Porter was a veterinarian who trained veterinary technicians. His wife, Terry, and Ed Clark's wife, Nancy Sheffield, were both veterinary technicians, so taking care of a few animals would be no problem. And Ed had developed a reputation in conservation circles, so he could handle whatever minor fundraising might be necessary. The Shenandoah Valley Wildlife Treatment and Rehabilitation Center was started in the barn on Ed and Nancy's common ground farm. The first month saw... It was so beautiful, and for me, coming from a big city, it was just glorious for me. My name is Marilyn Nash, and I began volunteering at the Wildlife Center in about 1984, I think. I would go with one or two others, and uh, we would um, volunteer, and in the winter it was so cold, and we were just so bundled, and we would have to chip ice out of the water buckets. And Ed and, and Nancy became great friends, and they actually were instrumental in introducing me to my husband. So um, that was another little perk that I got out of the Wildlife Center. By 1985, it was apparent that the demand extended beyond the valley, so the name was changed to the Wildlife Center of Virginia, and the patient load also outgrew the barn. So the center moved to its leased site in Weir's Cave, housed first in a double-wide trailer and now in a second, smaller trailer. After they had moved to Weir's Cave, there was more ability to develop the education administrative part of it as well as the veterinary part. So we had really come up in the, to the double wides. Education coordinator would have been the job. There was me and two others, Jenny Chandler and Jane Cox, wonderful, wonderful educators. They did more of the actual programs, lots and lots and lots of school programs all over Virginia, some in Maryland and all over. We were just exhausted at the end of the school year. They were on the road all the time. Thousands and thousands of people they, they spoke to. In its first decade of operation, the center presented environmental education programs to more than 400,000 Virginians, 75% of them school children. 
This year, its educational programs will reach more than 70,000 through more than 400 presentations. I had a one-year internship, so I started in 1st of September or something in uh, 2009 and basically finished uh, uh, at that point a uh, year later. My name is Matis uh, Leivitz and I'm from Estonia and uh, how I ended up uh, to Wildlife Centre of Virginia. So basically it was 2009 and I was uh, looking uh, something to, uh, you know, educate myself more uh, on uh, on this wildlife medicine topic and I started to look different uh, locations and one of those was Wildlife Center of Virginia. I applied um, and uh, somehow the Wildlife Center picked me. I guess I was like a wild card. Um, I, I'm quite sure a lot of people even didn't know where Estonia kind of uh, was located. So it wasn't only medical skills, uh, what I was taught, but also uh, how to talk to people, how to lobby, how to how to how organizations should be work uh, working. So and and of course the spe people skills. Uh, I think this was a really huge part, uh, and and. Uh, so I was able to actually see and uh, have a feel and try out pretty much all the different parts. Of course, the medical part was the largest. Uh, I returned to Estonia and I, I held uh, actually multiple positions. The Estonian Fund for Nature was kind of the first, but of course the Estonian University of Life Science, uh, where we are, where I'm uh, sitting right now. We started the wildlife medicine course for the veterinarians, uh, so the students get the basics of uh, how to handle and treat uh, wild animals. And, and of course, we do field works. And I'm also the sitting president of Estonian Veterinary Association. So the long uh, list uh, of wildlife activities, what uh, we are doing here uh, are uh, quite significant, I would say. I think that Buddy and his siblings, the rock stars, came three years later. Um, really, they form an important part of the, the history of this of this organization. If you're going to tell the story of the Wildlife Center, you're going to have to you're going to have to do the story of Buddy. And you're going to have to do the story of the rock stars. My name is Randy Hewa. Uh, I'm executive vice president of the Wildlife Center, of Virginia. Buddy the Bald Eagle was the introduction of too many people of this organization. Buddy came with a following. Buddy came with a fan club. Buddy has his own palace, his own enclosure uh, that was paid for by people who bought copies of the Gardens of Eagle, Garden of Eagles calendar. The proceeds of the sale that one year were dedicated to, to building a permanent home for him. nesting pair were known as Mom Norfolk and Dad Norfolk, Buddy's parents. Um, Mom Norfolk one day wanders, flies off from the nest, flies to the Norfolk International Airport, which is just over the tree line from the Norfolk Botanical Garden, is on the runway, is struck by an oncoming plane and, and is killed. And the, the decision was made by um, now the Department of Wildlife Resources to have the eagles come up here to have us care for them, uh, to ha have us raise them until they were ready to be released. Okay. <laughs> it's a great shirt. It's, it's, this, this is my party shirt whenever I go to friends' houses, basically. <laughs> I'm Amy Durden. I came to the Wildlife Center from following various cams that got me to the Norfolk Botanical Garden cam, so I came with the rock stars. 
our team and a volunteer relatively quickly built an eagle nest that we put up in one of the flight pens. Um, we relatively quickly put up a critter cam, sort of a rudimentary critter cam, which continued to broadcast through the same, uh, the, the same broadcast that had been used for the eagle nest down in Norfolk. There was a, I mean, gargantuan following at that point. I mean, Decorah had a lot of people, but that was nothing compared to what was following the um, Norfolk Eagles. All of this took 48 hours, maybe less than that. So people were able to check in. And once again, there was a there was a flood of public interest in these eagles, but we were we had a better website, we had a critter cam, so we were much better able to communicate what was going on with these birds. I would I was hooked. It was just a lot of fun to see something. I mean, we I'm in Colorado. I see eagles, I see hawks, I see plenty of birds, but it was but not so up close and personal. Um, and so the story of the Norfolk Botanical Garden eagles just was compelling. I had always said that I did not think that you could bond with an animal that you did not see. One of the, the great benefits of the wildlife center is that we gave people the opportunity to see a red-tailed hawk, to see a great horned owl, uh, to experience it, to watch it, uh, and to connect with it. And I didn't think you could connect with that way through a website or through your computer. And I was wrong. I was a hundred percent wrong. I, I actually went into labor with my child at the Wildlife Center, at the Double Wide. <laughs> so she's been connected to the Wildlife Center for her uh, 29 years. And in fact is, um, and I'm sure it's part of the Wildlife Center influence, but is in veterinary school as we speak and is thinking about um, going into wildlife medicine, exotic medicine, things like that. So it has impacted us in many different ways. It's a special place. It's a unique place and it's making a difference. The trees are my friends. I would first uh, want to thank you uh, now more than 13 years ago, uh, when I got the chance to come there and study and uh, learn um, uh, how things are uh, done. So, and of course, uh, give all my best and, uh, for the Wildlife Center uh, people uh, uh, for this 40 year anniversary. And a number of people sort of made the connection of the, the, my initial introduction to the Wildlife Center was because of an animal. One of the reasons that I stay connected to the Wildlife Center is because of the people, the people who work here. My colleagues have an understanding that this work is made possible only through the support and involvement of caring people. And see where my friends I, I feel like it's been a lovely addition to my life. I, we've been there at least three times, maybe four times. And it's just, it's, it's neat to know it's there, um, share it with friends that, you know, when, I guess maybe when my dad died, I sort of asked for, you know, contributions to the Wildlife Center. You guys do a really good job of getting as much out of what you have as you can. Um, and that's a lot of, I mean, that's what everybody's pretty much having to do now, but you, you take it to a fine art. And the sun is my friend, it warms me again, it wakes and laughs with me as it reaches down through the leaves on the limbs of the tree.
Thanks for taking our journey through time with us. I hope you enjoyed this video. There were a lot of changes that you can see from our early days in the horse barn to the double wide trailer to our current facility here in Waynesboro, Virginia that we've occupied for 27 years now. And I'm here to tell you that there are changes coming in the very near future that will make all of that pale by comparison. So stay with us. The best is yet to come. The first 40 years, we've been warming up. We've done a great deal. But as I say, there are some exciting things we'll be announcing over the next year as we spend the next 12 months celebrating the first 40 years of accomplishment. So thanks for watching our video. Watch your email and your mailbox for new announcements and new information. And we hope you'll join us in celebrating the next 40 years of the Wildlife Center of Virginia. Even when injuries appeared to be from natural causes, the influence of humans was often involved. They discovered that even animals hit by cars had often been poisoned first, and that impaired their normal skills. In 1991, based on Stewart's research, Ed helped persuade the Virginia Pesticide Control Board to ban the pesticide Furidan. After years of delay, the Environmental Protection Agency also banned the pesticide three days later. Now some caring people are nursing the littlest hurricane victims back to health. I, I have this mental image of it sort of raining squirrels. That's how one wildlife caretaker describes what happened during the height of Hurricane Bonnie, when treetops snapped like dry matches and hundreds upon hundreds of baby squirrels were thrown 70 feet to the ground. As far as populations go, that's probably fairly significant. That probably represents at least 50, if not 90 percent of this generation of squirrels in that area. The lucky ones made it here to the Wildlife Center of Virginia in Waynesboro, where doctors are caring for broken tails, bruises, and dehydration. The youngest ones are being kept alive in incubators. And with no mamas to go to, feedings are four times a day by syringe. It may take a few weeks, but once these guys are healthy enough, they'll be released back into the wild near their homes in Virginia Beach. But with tall trees to nest in, you might be wondering, why not just release the squirrels in the woods of the Shenandoah Valley? These squirrels all came from the Virginia Beach area, and it's almost like an entire generation of squirrels would be missing from that area if we kept them all up here in the mountains. In the coming weeks, the center will look for volunteers who are willing to put up squirrel boxes in their backyards. The goal is to make the squirrels' next introduction into the real world far less bumpier than the first. The Wildlife Center of Virginia is the nation's leading veterinary hospital for native wildlife. The center has earned a reputation around the world as an effective and innovative force for wildlife conservation. Now, the Wildlife Center also has a new home. The center began its life-saving work in 1982 in a converted Augusta County horse barn. In 1985, the center moved to a group of trailers crowded onto one acre of rented land in Weir's Cave. However, to realize its potential, the Wildlife Center needed a permanent facility designed to meet the needs of wildlife. In 1990, a gift of land from the DuPont Company and the open arms of the community led the way to Waynesboro. With the help and support of countless friends, the dream would become a reality. The Wildlife Center would finally have a home where it could truly spread its wings and fly. The limitations of the past melted away to reveal a future full of promise and potential. On July 30, 1995, the Wildlife Center of Virginia began a new era in wildlife conservation with the opening of its new $1.1 million teaching and research hospital for native wildlife. The ribbon cutting was the culmination of five years of planning, fundraising, building, and struggle. The results were more than worth the effort. The new facility is thought to be the finest of its type in the world. Hey, the Public Defender's Office. Well, the big move has begun at the new Wildlife Center of Virginia. Final details of the construction work are being taken care of, and the patients are scheduled to be moved to the new center this weekend. Our Valley Bureau Chief, Gary Smith, joins us live from the current center in Weir's Cave with this report. Gary. Dave, this is the site where the original concept of a wildlife hospital, a research center, and a teaching facility first took shape. They've been here since 1985, and in that decade, they've accumulated a hodgepodge of trailers and cages, but now they're ready to move to Waynesboro to a brand new 
Wildlife Center of Virginia. Joining me now is one of the original founders of the Wildlife Center and its president, Ed Clark. Thanks for being with us. It's nice to be here, Gary. We hope that this is going to be one of your last chances to broadcast from Weir's Cave at the Wildlife Center. Why in the world would you want to leave here? Well, it's not that the uh, place doesn't have a certain mystique, but uh, we really do need a place to do business. We've outgrown this facility several years ago. Uh, the volume of animals we get, like this little possum that come in sometimes as many as 50 in a single day, the baby animals in spring, we just can't deal with it here anymore. Uh, we need to grow. Our programs need to continue to expand, and this place just doesn't give us the opportunity anymore. Okay, and we'll take a quick look at the new Wildlife Center. We have some tape of uh, the Wildlife Center over in Waynesboro, and you can just sort of tell us what we see here. Well, this is the front of the new building. The new hospital is 5,700 square feet. As you can see, it's a very well-appointed, full, uh, state-of-the-art medical facility. There's the picture window looking into the operating room and down the long central corridor. Uh, we're having our x-ray equipment put in today, and our cages, uh, which are going to be ready to receive animals this weekend, are being built. A lot of volunteer labor has gone into this, and uh, it really is a, a community project. Okay, thank you, Ed. And uh, you mentioned volunteers. A lot of volunteers work in the project. You need some more volunteers to move the animals, I hear. We sure do. This weekend and for the next several weekends, we are really putting out the call. Anyone who wants to put a real hand on this project should give us a call at Waynesboro at 942-WILD and sign up. We'd love to have you swing a nail or move a box. Okay, thanks a lot, Ed Clark. Basically, what we have here is a chance for the Wildlife Center of Virginia to move into a facility that matches its reputation. I'm Gary Smith reporting live from Weir's Cave. Conservation efforts have helped stabilize the population, but in the past two weeks alone, two have died from lead poisoning after ingesting shotgun pellets. TV3's Rob Bover has more on the story. With a wingspan of some nine feet, the bald eagle can be an awe-inspiring sight, but as these x-rays show, the birds are being felled by the tiniest amount of lead. When uh, it only takes one part per million to kill a bird uh, with, with lead poisoning. It doesn't take long to, uh, for a bird to absorb that much from a very few number of pellets. According to the Wildlife Center, hunters are the problem. Not that they are shooting the birds, rather they are not retrieving other game. Left in the wild, the wounded or dead animals, as well as the shotgun pellets, are then eaten by bald eagles. Lead poisoning can lead to rapid weight loss and paralysis. There are always going to be those times when an animal is shot, and a few of them do get away. But uh, as a lifelong hunter and as a former uh, hunter safety instructor, I can tell you that one of the basic principles of sportsmanship is recovering the game that you use. And in fact, it's a matter of state law. The Virginia Wildlife Center, a not-for-profit, state-of-the-art veterinary hospital, treats thousands of injuries in wild animals each year. The hospital is the only one of its kind in the Commonwealth. But lead poisoning, which also affects other birds of prey, can be the most frustrating because it is wholly preventable. If uh, hunters used steel shot instead of lead, this would uh, not be a problem for, for any other animal. It is estimated there are some 200 bald eagles left in Virginia. Two have died so far, but the Wildlife Center says that may be just the tip of the iceberg if hunters are not more careful when they head into the wild. Rob Bovert, TV3 News, Waynesboro. And still to come on TV3, Gingrich heads up the house again. And some local... But not with their guns. We'll explain a little later. Be on the lookout for in Charlotte. Center of Virginia, where another bald eagle died of lead poisoning. Ken Slack explains why and how you can help keep it from happening again. More than half the animals that come to the Wildlife Center will survive and return to the wild. But in the past 10 weeks, the hospital has twice tried in vain to save bald eagles that swallowed lead shot. One from Westmoreland County, which is over uh, along the uh, Chesapeake Bay area, and the other from right here in Augusta County. Uh, these birds came in showing signs of depression. They, they couldn't uh, fly properly, and it was pretty obvious to us since there were no external injuries that the birds had been poisoned. These are the x-rays of the two recently deceased eagles that we saw here at the Wallace Center of Virginia. Most likely, uh, these pellets were in uh, a meal that it had, either a, uh, a bird or a small mammal that had been shot with lead pellets, and then this eagle ingested the lead uh, secondarily. So it's not that the birds are being poisoned primarily or on purpose, but they're getting secondhand poison. 
The secondhand poison can kill any bird of prey, from hawks to vultures to our national symbol. And most of these deaths are preventable. The Wildlife Center advises small game hunters to abandon their use of lead shot. Steel shot, which is non-toxic, is available. Uh, a lot of hunters are traditionalists and uh, refuse to believe that steel shot is as effective as lead shot. And uh, so right now, particularly for upland hunting, steel shot is not very popular. It is available, however, and many hunters choose to use it simply out of a, a sense of conservation ethic. For those who swear by lead, the Wildlife Center urges you to recover your prey and dispose of it properly. Left behind, lead bullets and shot can kill twice. In Augusta County, Ken Slack, Dateline 29 News. What we're working on here is uh, a deer fawn. This is Dr. Flo Singh, who's our new associate veterinarian, who's uh, here on a one-year internship from uh, New York. Uh, Dr. Singh has been uh, practicing in small animal practice for eight years and has, uh, for some unknown reason, decided to go into <laughs> wildlife medicine. And Sarah Sneed is our uh, veterinary technician and hospital manager. And uh, the little fawn that they're holding here is uh, a fawn that had been attacked by a dog. And uh, a couple just happened to be uh, taking a walk in the woods and, and saw the dog attack the fawn. And they brought it into us. And uh, Flo, why don't you take it from there and tell us what you're going to do here. OK, great. This fawn um, actually came in yesterday. And on initial evaluation, she was very shocky. Um, we got an intravenous catheter established and got her stabilized and then took her to surgery um, where we repaired a fractured leg bone. Right now I'm just going to do a follow-up physical and make sure that uh, everything is going as planned. I want to clean up some of the cuts. She's already had some antibiotics this morning. So I'm going to start at the head and um, I usually just start up here, feel the lymph nodes, make sure they feel fine. How is it all possible? The center has a staff of only 11, so it is dependent for its programs on a core of 250 volunteers statewide whose numbers have continued to grow. In addition to this core of caregiving volunteers, the center is dependent on contributions to support its $350,000 annual operating budget. It receives no government support. The number of active donors has increased from 2,500 two years ago to about 4,000 today. But there is an additional need. The center's 11 staff and usually about 150 animal patients are crammed into only 1,400 square feet of space in two trailers. The need for a modern research and treatment facility is acute if the center is going to continue treating thousands of Virginians every year who do not have Blue Cross coverage. Welcome back to the News at Noon. I'm very excited to kick off a brand new segment here on the News at Noon with the Wildlife Center of Virginia. Our good friend Amanda Nicholson, who I have worked with uh, a lot over the past year, is here with us today. And before anything else, tell us who you brought with us. <laughs> I brought uh, Pignoli, the Eastern Screech Owl, with me today. And he is uh, one of the educational animals there at the Wildlife Center, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep, Pignoli's been with us since 2003. Um, he actually is missing one eye and is mostly blind in the Ooh, other eye. So guy. that's why he's non-releasable. All right, now tell us a little bit, first of all, what is the mission of the Wildlife Center? For people who are unfamiliar with it, it's really a, a hidden gem in our community down in Waynesboro. Yeah, we, um, we're a hospital for native wildlife, and our mission is teaching the world to care about and to care for wildlife in the environment. And you deal with animals right here in the valley, but really across the state as well. Yep, all across Virginia and occasionally surrounding states as well, we'll get other animals in. What are some of the cases that you've all have been dealing with here recently? Um, well, 2011 has been a busy and big year for us. Um, and, and the Wildlife Center has been around for 29 years. So when we say this has been a year like none <laughs> other, that, that means something. And I know one of the reasons for that was a trio of baby eaglets that came in, I believe it was April, right? That really just kind of changed things yes. for you all. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. That's really, those three eaglets were kind of the big focus of this year. Um, we received the three of them after their mother was hit and killed by an airplane down in Norfolk. Um, so figuring that Dad Eagle wouldn't be able to keep up with them, the three of them came to us. Next on Wildlife Emergency, a difficult operation on a duck reaps some surprising results. Gosh, my goodness. This is a very unusual case. A young fox must be saved from deadly parasites. I will give him some cereal of bath with a medicated shampoo that will help a lot. 
and doctors race against the clock to get an injured osprey back to the wild. That was good. They're going into radiology. We got a problem here. Right. We have the opportunity to give these animals a second chance. But he's a little one. He's a very small one. Nice strong heartbeat. He's very handsome. With wildlife, humans are a big part of the problem, and I just want to try to be part of the solution. You not only need to read the mind of your co-workers, you need to read the mind of your patient. We've got five minutes to go before we get three hours. To save a wild animal's life and get it back in the wild, that's what it's all about. At the Wildlife Center of Virginia, ailing patients will do anything to prove that they don't need a doctor. But though this patient protests, it isn't hard to see that something is very wrong. She's just kind of not right. right. She tries real hard. 